We're going to be talking today about nutrition for mental health. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with gut brain microbiome stuff. It's the hot topic. We're going to go there a little bit and um, just kind of celebrate, you know, 2019. There's a lot of changes happening and a lot of things that we should know about. So I'm really grateful for the organization and thank you for the time and effort that we spent to put in. I did graduate here in 2012 and I did my dietetic internship through CSUN and um, went straight into private practice immediately. And I've built a successful practice in West LA called Nutrition and Recovery. And I've built up a team of other dietitians and at some point a couple of years ago decided I wanted to do more academic stuff. So went back to UCLA in the School of Public Health. And I'm currently a full-time PhD student and a full-time private practice dietitian. And it's a lot. Don't necessarily recommend it. Uh, but chase your dreams, whatever that may be. So plug for advanced education. I'll tell you, like, there's more to uh, PhDs than statistical analysis and publishing things. Like, I'll be honest with you, learning different theories and studying the way other disciplines look at problems has helped me tremendously in working one-on-one -on -one with people. Uh, one of the biggest uh, like gifts I'm able to give someone when they present with a health or, or uh, medical challenge is to be able to say, well, maybe uh, the exercise field looks at it this way. The eating disorder field looks at it this way. Psychology looks at it this way, right? And to be able to offer people multiple perspectives on a problem and to be able to individualize treatment using a biopsychosocial model of health. I uh, highly encourage people to continue to seek education even if you're not going to go further always stay learning uh, it's the it's like the thing that makes me happier than anything else so i read a lot of papers and we're going to do some of that today uh, this recently came from the lancet it just basically uh, estimate the global burden of mental illness and the estimates are somewhere around um, uh, a third of years lived with disability comes from mental illness and 13 percent of disability adjusted life years which are number of years lost due to ill health, um, come from mental illness, yet and still, the funding for mental illness is less than 1%. So there's a huge gap in the problem compared to the solution. So um, I'll say this, nutrition for mental health wasn't really an option for me. When I was in school, I didn't really think much of it. I came in as a personal trainer and was doing what felt like the socially constructed thing to do and was headed down sports nutrition. I did my master's thesis on substance abuse. And uh, I had encouragement from the faculty here to like explore something that was new and different. And I collected uh, original data from the VA. So also plug for master's thesis. Um, that was the thing that set me up to like take the next steps. And so since that time, you know, uh, becoming an expert in uh, uh, substance use disorder, it's led into learning about eating disorders and then learning about anxiety and depression and people that I work with one-on-one -on -one almost always have, um, they're in some form of treatment or therapy, etc. So it's a, it's a definitely uh, a, a niche area and something that is not for everyone, but it's uh, certainly f for me. And I'd love to be helpful to anyone that's looking to go down this road. The microbiome data has changed the game. We've always known nutrition for mental health was a thing, but like now we have a much more clear picture why. I think originally it was an interest in like deficiencies. I learned a lot about that in school. You learn like what are the nutrient deficiencies and how do you fix them? So nutrition for mental health was originally like, all right, what, what vitamins and minerals do we need to boost up that might be low that are linked to mental illness? And um, in the last few years, We've now started to look at things a little bit differently. Yes, deficiencies are important, but um, there's a lot more going on. Uh, we all know there's a second brain, a couple trillion little organisms living inside of us that uh, need to be taken care of as well. And the evidence that it impacts mental health has been a game changer because it makes a really strong case that what we eat matters, right? Like what you eat has a profound effect on your gut bacteria and your gut bacteria affects your mental health. So it's an indirect pathway, but the pathway is clear. So it's an exciting time. The reason this has gotten big is because we have now technology to where we can uh, uh, sample bacteria really easily from like a, a stool sample. Who sent in a stool sample? 
one person, two people, okay, it's time. It's time to know what kind of bacteria you have living inside of you. Uh, it changes. It's elusive. There's things that are passing through. Um, but I, I've been screaming this from the mountaintop. Like, if dietitians don't move in on this, other fields will. And actually, they are. Right? So, like, if we don't move in and become experts in bacteria and gut microbiome, like, we're going to be left behind. Period. Like, this is the future, without a shadow of a doubt. So I've been encouraging dietitians to develop expertise in this, even if you don't think it's relevant to your interests. It is, and more will be revealed in upcoming years. So we have technology where we can rapidly figure out what uh, species are present in different samples. So there's a lot of funding. Uh, there's expectations for this industry of probiotics to double in the next five years. A lot of it's uh, uh, funded by private industry. If you think about like the Yakults and these companies that are now selling probiotics and they're pushing some of this forward as well. But the government funding is starting to show up and it's really exciting. Um, when I was like new to gut bacteria, I learned that it has some basic functions like regulating motility, breaking down fibers, etc. cetera. Um, we biosynthesizing vitamins and minerals, destroying things that may not need to be there. Um, but in the last few years, the picture is becoming more clear. Gut microbiota affects the development of disease. And then where I'm interested is how it affects brain health. This is marching forward. Uh, and how it affects learning and behavior. So hopefully you guys have heard some things. Uh, this got a lot of attention. This uh, finding that 90% of serotonin is produced in the gut. Has anyone heard that? Okay, um, about 50% of uh, dopamine is produced in the gut. And these estimates are rough, and I think we'll probably get clearer estimates as time goes by. But this is really key, because if neurotransmitters are produced in the gut, uh, then the gut ecosystem is going to make a big difference in uh, 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 neural activity. So just to be clear, there's a difference between neurotransmitter production and neurotransmitter activity. Does that make sense? So just because something is produced doesn't mean that it's happening. So it's important to know. Uh, I'm really big on diagrams, and hopefully you guys have studied the gut lining a little bit. Just to start to make sense out of it all, uh, we have gut bacteria that breaks down different substrates, whether it be, in this case, we're looking at amino acids, and then does a conversion process to these different neurotransmitters, pass through to the blood, and then travel and where I'm interested. How does the food that we eat by way of gut bacteria, neurotransmitter, reach the brain? Because the brain is the hub of our entire life, right? It's the appetite center, etc. This looks more specifically at dietary fiber, which is something we're going to talk a lot about today. Uh, dietary fiber is uh, often converted to short chain fatty acids. And again, these are things that pass through uh, the intestinal lining enter the portal circulation and travel to the various organ systems. So, I mean, we've always known it, like trust your gut. We've always known butterflies in the stomach. We've known a lot of these things, but now the data is making it clear so we can make a stronger case. So what I mean by making a stronger case is like when I get people who come to see me for a one-on-one, -on -one, they have ideas about how nutrition is. They've learned stuff, they've read blogs, they have some ideas about energy balance. Maybe they know about calories. Maybe they've been to nutritionists before. And then when you're able to present to them a new way of looking at uh, their issues, right? You can really have to reframe their entire, like, let's not do that. Let's just eat to improve your gastrointestinal ecosystem. And let's wait and see what, the, like, like what nature has in store for you, right? And it's, it's a challenging thing if someone's not... Um, like pre pre prepared for this, right? So I guess what I'm trying to say in a nutshell, I'll just get right to it. We got to go way beyond calories, vitamins, and minerals. That's like just the basics. That's the basics of nutrition, right? We have to go way beyond these things in order to understand human behavior. And this is a, a, a big area. So nutrition, in my opinion, has taken an overly reductionistic approach, which means we've reduced things to measurable and studyable things, right? Like the calorie unit, the B vitamins, et cetera. Um, it, and it's, it's, it's not anyone's fault. It's just the way research is set up. So for example, if you wanted to do a study to look at the impact of something, 
you would probably use a dietary supplement rather than a food because you can control all the other components of, of the study, right? There's something called food synergy, which is how different nutrients and fibers combine, right? And that's a very difficult thing to study, per se. So the way that research has kind of dictated nutrition is to seek information has been in a very reductionistic way. We look at single things, we control our environment. If you think about it, it's really hard to do like real randomized control trial research with nutrition, right? First of all, like people aren't blinded. Nutrition is slow. It takes such a long time that the impact isn't going to happen in days and weeks. It's going to be months and years. And now we're talking about millions of dollars of funding and right. It's not going to happen. Right. So we've always looked at single nutrients and, um, Again, uh, I think that we've missed the boat a little bit, okay? And hopefully you'll get that message today. Uh, Nutrition for Mental Health also thinks about, you know, what we eat, obviously. But what, what I do as a one-on-one dietitian is think about someone's relationship to food, right? Eating behavior, right? What is, like, you know, someone's dopamine, dopamine signaling cascades, right? Their reward-seeking behavior, all of those things uh, are important. And then also really important is how we think about food, okay? So if you're talking about nutrition for mental health, one of my intake questions in my private practice is what percentage of the day do you spend thinking about food and body? If someone spends 70% of the day thinking about food, that's a mental health problem, right? They might be the most nourished person around, right? But their brain's hijacked by thoughts of their body and what they're gonna eat, and yada, yada. Of course, if you're a student, you might be an exception. You're thinking about it more than the average person. But one of the outcomes that I'm looking to do with people, if they're confused about nutrition, they're thinking about it and they're eating and they're stressed out and they have disordered eating, what if we could get that 70 down to 30, to where you're thinking about it much less? So there's a lot to nutrition for mental health, if that makes it clear. It does have to do with nutrients. It does have to do with uh, bacteria. It does have to do with someone's cognitive processes around food and body. And they're all really important pieces. I'm interested in the brain. I've been self-taught in uh, topics related to neuroscience for many years. It's been one of the keys to my success because I work with people that have substance use disorders. And understanding what goes on underneath the hood is of critical importance. So, for example, we talk about this food that the gut microbes break down, pass through uh, by different uh, pathways. Anyone have heard of the vagus nerve? That's a really popular area of research right now as part of the gut-brain access, something you should look into if you haven't already. But the point is, it's not just neurotransmitter production and short-chain fatty acids. There's signaling mechanisms that talk to the hypothalamus and essentially give us information about how hungry we should be, how full we should be, when we should signal to start, stop eating, etc. So this is all really exciting and part of the big picture. Hormones are used as part of the communication network from the gut to the brain. So I've uh, learned uh, somewhat recently that these short chain fatty acids can actually be precursors to hormones and hormones are communication networks that are sent all around the body. So to, to really master nutrition, you have to understand the gut, you have to understand hormones, and you have to understand the brain. And these aren't things that are like traditionally covered in your intro to dietetics classes, right? So you kind of got to like seek this information out in order to get a truly comprehensive picture. And I would encourage everyone to go there. So originally, like I said, we looked at vitamins and minerals. Essential fatty acids have been important in the mental health world. Omega-3 has gotten a lot of attention. Hopefully you've seen some of that literature. There's a big trend towards amino acid, high dose amino acid supplementation for the production of neurotransmitters. I find that to be a little controversial, especially with the addiction world, and we're not gonna talk about that. There's been some trends in time, food and mood, right? Uh, Emotional eating, these are like great topics for groups that I might run in a treatment center. But the big stuff now that's gotten a lot of, you know, both controversy and attention is uh, uh, food allergies, food sensitivities, inflammatory cascades that are created at the gut level from food, uh, from compromised uh, intestinal permeability, and then uh, oxidative stress. So my my research interest, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to see it all the way through, is thinking about how food can affect inflammation in the gut, which essentially, guess what, like travels to the brain. And if, 
inflammation reaches the brain, there's part of the brain called the amygdala where we have things like depression, anxiety, cravings, etc. There might be uh, a lot of inflammation that's reaching the brain that we're not quite aware of. What if we as dietitians could help intervene, that help improve uh, mental health through food? So here's the hot topic, right? M most people, um, I think, uh, uh, if we look at a cascade of inflammation versus gut permeability, um, an ideal setup would be a diverse microbiome. So just to make it clear in case I haven't already, a healthy gut has a lot of species. More species is better. Not always, but the Western diet, the Western gut is typically understood as having a reduction in bacterial species. So when you lose out on beneficial microbes, you're left with more susceptibility, okay? So a healthy gut has a rich and diverse microbiome, a lot of species. We are losing out on beneficial bacteria. There will be a, a healthy mucosal barrier and an immune system that's working. Once things start to change and guts become more permeable, there's a reduction in species, more oxidative stress, more inflammation, and then we end up over here. And I would guess that a lot of people in the United States, even if you eat really healthfully, are more here than we know it. A lot of people are experiencing inflammation, intestinal permeability, and aren't even aware of it. It just becomes like the baseline. Most people don't know how good you can actually feel, like how like great life can be. Most people don't know that like one can wake up and feel bliss in the morning, like before a cup of coffee, right? Most people aren't aware of how awesome right life could be because of a lot of it has to do with our, our health. And we as nutrition people can be in the position to uh, uh, help bring that to the light. Of course, if someone's obsessed with their health, that's all they think about, again, there's problems there as well. So data on nutrition and depression has been around for uh, several years. There's a lot of studies that show the more fruits and vegetables people eat, the happier they are. The less they eat, the less fibers they eat, the more likely they are to be depressed. So 10 years ago, we might have looked at that and said, Okay, well, is it the vitamin C? Like, what, is it the B vitamins? What, what is it about fruits and vegetables? And now we know that it has to do with the fibers that are in the foods and the synergistic effect between the fibers and the phytochemicals. So if you take fiber supplements and just do the extracts and you, you just supplement with fiber, it doesn't give you the same benefit as eating whole food fibers. And the reason is because there's a synergy between all the phytochemicals in the food and the fibers that promote optimal bacterial response. So I work with eating disorders, and I work with a lot of people one-on-one. -on -one. I've worked in some treatment settings. I do believe that there's a need to update some of the models uh, because of this new data. There is a, um, there is a, a lot of emphasis on the kind of psychological and therapeutic parts of it, and not enough emphasis on the biological parts of it. Uh, the message that's often received by patients in an eating disorder treatment center if they have you know gut stuff it's like it's in your head right and like there's a trend now toward people understanding like no actually like it's real right a lot of it's in people's head it's a bi-directional thing a lot of it's created uh but with new information about neuroinflammation with new information about gut health there's a trend towards starting to understand how we can do better in the treatment world right one of the questions that I've been asking, right, like if you think about the diet, binge, kind of restrict, binge cycle, right, most people know that as being common with disordered eating. Um, I've been starting to ask the question, like, where does all the dieting come from in the first place, right? Like if dieting is the fundamental cause of binge eating, like why is it that so many people are dieting these days? Like, What is it that's driving all of so that's the difference between looking at a problem at an individual level versus looking at it at a public health level. Does that make sense? It's really important to be able to put on multiple hats, to look at something from a more psychosocial view, a biological view, to look at a problem at an individual level or at a community or population level. Those are different things. And being able to bounce between them can make you a very effective uh, either practitioner or academic. So yeah, there is evidence of the overlap between food allergies and disordered eating, right? A lot of times it might drive people's restrictions or concerns about food, and then it gets worse over time. 
Um, I've worked with really challenging cases, so I know a little bit about this stuff. I just include this because this is the, the lane that I found myself in, biopsychosocial, being able to merge information from different disciplines and to be able to help people. In 2014, I saw this in the lay press, and it suggested, right, this is like, they, you know, sometimes they want to make a splash, right, this idea of like, is it possible that the bacteria that live inside of you might be signaling you for uh, food, right? And I, I do think that in the last few years, we've gotten more and more support for this. It's like, actually, no, 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 it's not like a kooky, quackery thing. Like, there's evidence to show that there are bacteria that prefer certain things, and if that's true, they can signal the host to consume that food to improve the bacteria's fitness to improve their survival chances. I saw a study not too long ago about a particular strain of microbes that sequester iron from food. And like, it totally made sense because I've known a lot of people that are kind of red meat addicts, right? They need to eat red meat twice a day. Why is it so, what if, and I don't have answers, I'm just giving the what if. What if they had an overgrowth of the bacteria that like required iron and that bacteria was like signaling for the consumption of more of that in order to survive. And what if, when you didn't get it, they had a way of inducing dysphoria in the host to make them get the thing that we need? So it's really exciting when you start linking the biology at the gut ecosystem to the human psychology and the behavior. It's really, really fascinating. There's a lot of studies in animal models, but another one that caught my attention is like artificial sweeteners. Everyone knows about Diet Coke addiction. Like, how do you explain it? Like it hasn't been explained. They've made billions of dollars and no one's really understood it. What if there was bacteria that really loved the artificial sweeteners and were like, you know, set up to make that part of the craving cascade? We'll talk a little bit about food addiction today. It's a controversial topic that I just love um, because I like controversy. I like science and I do think it's an important topic. And again, a topic that is different if you look at it at the individual versus the public health level. Um, all right, so we've 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 covered this, right? Um, these are question marks. Again, are the gut bacteria telling us to eat or to not eat? They're doing a lot of research with anorexia and microbiome. Like, you know, why? You know, is it possible that there's changes in gut bacteria that are causing people to? Uh, uh, loss, lose their hunger, be restrictive, etc. And the evidence is starting to show like, we're not saying causal mechanism, we're not saying this bacteria is causing, but they're able to say there's, there's differences. There's differences in people that have eating disorders in terms of their gut bacteria. How fascinating is that? So my area of expertise is addiction, uh, better known now as substance use disorder. Most of you know it's a growing burden. The opioid crisis is in full-fledged. Um, there's no uh, uh, standards of practice for, for nutrition. So if you were to look at an elderly home or an eating disorder treatment center, they would have a requirement for a dietitian of some sort. In the uh, substance use disorder world, there is absolutely no standards at all. So I've tried to do the best that I can to help create some of these uh, uh, standards, um, considerations for settings. Um, and I'll share a little bit about that as well. So there's a trend in the private sector towards using nutrition to help with treatment, but it hasn't um, gotten enough evidence, and hopefully that'll change. We know there's malnutrition um, with addiction. We know that there's a high preference for sweets, which is coupled with a low intake of fruits and vegetables. So it's like a predictable eating pattern. High, you know, sugar, low fiber, right? Western diet. Um, I'm a big fiber person. I just, I have this weird feeling that like if everyone ate 30 grams of real fiber per day, like the world would be a different place. Like that's what, <laughs> no, I really do. And I don't mean like in, in like a week. I mean like if we did it for like two decades, right? Like that the bacteria would change and like things would be different, right? Like the entire world would change. Uh, they're also studying bacteria at the planetary level. You know, dive into the literature. There's so much there. It's so exciting. So uh, originally, again, addiction nutrition looked at micronutrient deficiencies, inflammation, uh, oxidation, antioxidation disturbances. We know that when people get sober, they often gain a lot of weight. 30 pounds in 30 days is not uncommon. 
Uh, often they're uh, malnourished or underweight when they present to treatment. So it's not like a surprise. The old model was like, yeah, like let's get, let's help them gain weight as fast as possible. The traditional message in recovery was always like, first things first, right? Like don't stress people out about nutrition, like let them do the, the thing that they need to do to feel okay. But if it's true that, you know, gut health affects mental health, right? Like if it's true what the literature is starting to converge and say, it would make a pretty strong case that we do need to talk about uh, nutrition in early recovery. Uh, there's a lot of body image and weight related concerns uh, for people that enter treatment. I work with co-occurring eating disorder and substance use disorder. There's also been this kind of thought process of like, which one do you treat first, right? Like, and so the treatment settings are very split. In other words, there's people that go from like one treatment to the next. They're bouncing between eating disorder and addiction treatment. So I'm like really pushing for integrated treatment models where we treat these things concurrently. But if you think about it, like if weight related concerns are driving people towards substance abuse and that's not addressed, that could lead to high risk of relapse. And it's not something that's being discussed. So I'm trying to get like body image groups in addiction treatment centers and get uh, eating disorder treatment centers on board with um, knowing more about uh, addiction related issues. Vape's a big thing in that community. One survey showed that around 13 or 14 percent were vaping for weight loss or control, right? So you think about how a lot of the different behaviors that we engage in uh, can um, be related to mental health, and sometimes people don't even know it. If there's trauma, a lot of times people are like influenced by subconscious wounds, right? And to be informed in trauma will also really benefit you as a practitioner, because a lot of people have them you want to know when to be able to detect that so you can refer them to a therapist or to a specialist. So the overlap between addiction and eating disorder is somewhere between 3 and 50%, which is pretty high. Um, uh, so yes, um, if you're interested in working with this population, there is a need. There is a need for people that are specialized in behavioral health. So I see things like night eating, um, dietary restraint. People in early addiction recovery have neurochemical extremes, so are more likely to gravitate towards, you know, a keto diet or a fasting. So they're like more susceptible to extreme behaviors and to be able to help people reel that in can really make a difference. I mean, we're di we've got like 150 people dying per day related to the opioid crisis in the United States. The burden is significant. I've probably lost 20 friends in the last five years, just right, just from being in the recovery community and working in this field. Um, it, it's significant, and nutrition hasn't really gotten any attention yet. And it's important. I'm, sh I'm sure of it. Of course, I'm biased, but I'm, I've never been so sure of anything. Um, there's a link between stimulant medication and uh, bulimia. One of the questions that I ask people on my intake is not just what medications are you on, what medications have you been on? So for example, I see a lot of people that were on things like Adderall, Ritalin in their 20s and now have weight regulation issues in their 30s. Does that make sense? Another really important area to, to get some expertise on is epigenetics, right? How things can be expressed differently. So uh, suppressing weight for four, year, for four years early on in life, suppressing appetite can cause changes in gut bacteria, changes in uh, epigenetics that make it really easy for someone to gain weight later on in life. And these things are what totally defy the basic mathematical calories in, calories out stuff that so much of, so many of us have learned. So um, I, uh, I'm interested in alcohol as well. I'm not going to go through all these little details. I'll cut right to the gut stuff. Um, alcohol really um, impairs the intestinal lining. Uh, so who studied alcoholic liver disease, right? It's kind of part of medical nutrition therapy to some extent, a little bit, you learn about it. We've totally figured out like some truths about it that we had no ideas about before. Um, it turns out that the alcoholic liver damage is not necessarily caused directly by the ethanol. It's caused by 
the bacterial translocation by way of intestinal permeability. So when the alcohol causes gut dysbiosis, we have an inflammation, tight junctions are disrupted, microbial products can leak into the blood vessels, and these end up going to the liver, causing immune activation, and that's what causes the liver damage. So the, the problems associated with the liver from alcohol have to do with the gut, if that makes sense. And so it points to like, well, what about these other pills? What about heroin, et cetera? So they're using uh, micro, microbial-based treatments for alcoholic liver disease. There is some evidence of probiotics being helpful. There's one study that showed at three weeks sober, those that had more gut leakiness had higher levels of craving, higher levels of depression, et cetera. I know gut leakiness is not a dietitian approved term. I'm aware. We call it intestinal permeability. But that's what it is. It, it's a thing. The alternative medicine people, naturopaths and stuff like this have known about it for a while. And a lot of nutrition people kind of have like poo-pooed on it uh, because it, the, we're not really sure. But the evidence has come around. Turns out that like intestinal permeability can cause a lot of problems and a lot more people have it. And just so it makes sense, it's not always like a ton of stuff leaking through. It's like a, like a part of a bacteria that gets through and causes low-grade systemic inflammation that can be persistent over long periods of time. It's not like high levels of inflammation that someone would even be aware of. It's a low-grade inflammation that might be causing mental health problems. And so it can travel to the brain, right? The withdrawal, uh, dysbiosis, nervous system, it ends up in the brain. So uh, hopefully, you know, we'll learn more about this in upcoming years. We only know a little bit. So there's a bi-directional communication network between the gut and the brain. There's a lot of pathways. I would encourage people to consider learning about the nervous system, the vagus nerve, etc. With drug addiction, it's different than alcohol. We can't do research really easily. It turns out that um, uh, it's hard to do research with meth or heroin, right? It's hard to follow people. So it's mostly retrospective. And it's hard to uh, get large sample sizes. So the data is really weak. Uh, we do know some things. There's a high preference for sugar and sugar-sweetened foods. We know that there's low polyunsaturated fatty acid levels in the brain. We have evidence of omega-3s being helpful for uh, mental health recovery and early uh, addiction. This is both in animals as well as humans. There's uh, some differences in gut bacteria in those that use substances like cocaine. This graph doesn't do much justice because of the color. But just uh, know that different substances are associated with different kind of microbial changes. Isn't that interesting? No, it's really interesting. Think about it for a second, right? Like, like what if, going back to the what ifs, what if certain bacteria had a strong preference for certain substances as well, right? Like, and, and if you think about opioids, right? Opioids slow down the gastrointestinal tract. So oftentimes, like some people are constipated for like 10 days, two weeks even. Think about the opportunities for microbial growth in the slow transit time. Think about what's possible. So they're doing a lot of cool animal research. I'm at UCLA, so I'm on the cutting edge and learning like, I'm, like the stuff that hasn't even come out yet. It's actually really, really exciting. This study showed that animals with reduced gut bacteria had a different response to cocaine reward. Interesting. It's starting to get super interesting. With meth, we have uh, some information about appetite changes. I, I found this to be really interesting. Speed users were nearly twice as likely to become obese compared to opioid users. So again, it might be the periods of appetite suppression that led to like appetite dysregulation later on in life, or it could be the other direction, is that people that had weight-related concerns would gravitate towards speed, amphetamines, etc. Um, all really fascinating stuff. You see the same thing with meth, uh, changes in gut bacteria, leakiness, meth-induced neurotoxicity, etc. This is just a hypothesized possible uh, link between how meth can get to depression, eating disorders, anxiety. And guess what? It has to do with the gut-brain access. People that use opioids are mostly into, again, low fiber, easily digestible foods, ice cream, etc. Uh, constipation, diarrhea, um, when, when getting sober, 
and a lot of bowel dysfunction. So it's something that I have to help people with. It usually somewhat resolves on its own. You don't have to do any like drastic interventions in early opioid recovery, but people do present with issues there. So again, uh, emotionless environment can favor growth and we don't know what that looks like, but one study showed that in op morphine uh, users, there was a strain of bacteria that was increased by a hundredfold compared to the control group. It's getting interesting, isn't it? Mind blown, right? Like when I'm reading this stuff, like, I mean, I can't even sleep at night anymore, you guys. I'm up, <laughs> I'm just like reading papers, like trying to figure all this stuff out. Uh, because again, like there's a link with nutrition to everything. And I think uh, uh, the case needs to be made. And like we're the people to start making the case. Um, uh, there's a strong preference for sugar in early opioid recovery, and that's something that I help people with. We'll do a couple minutes on food addiction. Um, there's a lot of support in the both animal and human literature. I encourage people to follow it, even if you don't believe in it. Um, a lot of dietitians don't like believe in it, right? Just it doesn't match the message that you were taught of like all foods fit. It's not about the food. I've like been on blogs where like there's eating disorder dietitians are like food addiction isn't real. Like it doesn't exist. They're like uh, upset about it. And I was trying to scratch my head and make sense of it all. Like why would someone be so like against something that, you know, has some scientific support? And the reason is because a lot of people are freaking out maybe unnecessarily about foods that they, maybe these people work with eating disorders, right? They're seeing it through the lens of their own experience, right? But there's also other experiences that are out there. So whether you agree with it or not, do some of the research to look at the neuroscience of it. Uh, the craving cascade, understanding the way the different parts of the brain communicate to each other with the memory and the dopamine receptors has been like game changer in my understanding of human eating behavior and has allowed me to help a lot of people. It doesn't mean you have to teach people to be abstinent or to use an addiction-centered approach that requires punitive, really rigid nutrition messaging, but I'm saying that it helps you understand human behavior as a whole, which is critical to success. So food addiction has blown up in recent years. There's been a lot of articles in the last 10 years I have written uh, some of them. If you're interested in sugar addiction, we wrote this within the last year in Frontiers. Uh, it does look at animal research, but certainly something worth knowing about. They've discerned between the wanting and the liking. So wanting is the, the, the uh, craving, right? There's a difference in the brain between wanting something, the actual like um, salience of it, the memory of it, and the actual euphoria, or the liking, the experience of it. So a lot of times the way that I understand food and food addiction is that the wanting goes up. People want something more and more over time, but the liking, the actual pleasure of it does not. Does that make sense? And that's how we understand addiction. Like, I don't know, when I was a dietetic intern, I did a, I did a rotation at an outpatient clinic for diabetes, and there was a guy who was uh, advanced diabetic. I, I don't know, I was newly in my career as an intern just observing. And the message was his diabetes had progressed so much that he was facing amputation. And uh, the message that he got from the healthcare team was like, if you don't change the way you eat, we're going to have to cut off your leg. And like, one would assume that a rational mind would snap into reality and just change the way you eat. And guess what? He couldn't. And that's when I knew like there's more going on. There's way more going on than just rationality, right? There's a lot more going on at the neurochemical level. And now in the last few years, there's stuff going on at the gastrointestinal level. And they're talking. So in early recovery, people tend to eat in a more addiction-like fashion. They're seeking rewards. They're seeking dopamine. And in a lot of treatment centers, they give unlimited access to highly palatable food. I'm starting to wonder, like, is this the best thing, right? Can we do better? Uh, I, we wrote this in, the, in our uh, parent... Uh, organization's journal. I proposed some nutrition education groups um, for use in uh, addiction treatment settings. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but that industry has gotten really, really big. Um, there's a lot of foul play going on in that world as well. I also teach people about cross addiction, um, other addiction related topics like novelty seeking, impulsivity, delay discounting. These are things that they use in the psychiatry and the addiction literature 
to study human behavior that I've been able to use to help people with their eating. Does that make sense? Um, and it's highly, highly effective. But the biggest challenge is that it always has to be eating disorder friendly, right? Like you always have to use language that doesn't get people tripping out like in cognitively distorted ways, right? And that's the biggest art and the challenge of being able to learn stuff and then message it, but then also be able to message it differently to different peoples based on their different levels of risk, right? So in a nutshell, like in a lot of eating disorder treatment centers, people are taught to like stop tripping out about trying to eat so healthfully. But in an addiction treatment center, like people really need to learn how to eat better, like period, right? So like, how do you balance the two goals, right? Especially if there's an overlap between the two. And that's the challenge in the art. So it, it, communication skills are important. There's a lot of positive associations between nutrition education and outcomes. Uh, uh, there's not enough, but there's a couple studies that we've been citing over, over the years. Um, I do believe that supplements can be helpful. I do recommend certain dietary supplements for people in early recovery. There is evidence for probiotics, omega-3, um, possibly some other vitamins, definitely some of the B vitamins. Um, but I do think that when you give people this idea that like supplements are enough, you're carrying the wrong message, right? That like people need to also understand that it's not just about nutrients. It's about relationship to food and eating behavior. So one of the things that I've often done with people that are on a lot of supplements, like take them off, take them off the things so that they have more of a like prioritizing of eating real food, right? Because this, uh, this idea that people got like, well, you got all your bases covered. You have insurance. You've got all your nutrients in the day, right? I think it's misleading, right? Because they're not getting that food synergy, the fiber, the phytochemicals and all those things together. And more importantly, like what's going on at the taste and uh, the trigeminal nerve hypothalamus level. There is evidence of probiotics being helpful for depression, certainly something that I've been able to use. To start wrapping up, the Western diet, as we've identified, is low in fiber, it's higher in sugars and artificial sweeteners. And the solution, in my opinion, is the reverse, right? Like a, a diet that's much higher in real fibers from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. And, you know, carrying this message to someone is not enough. People know these things, right? The challenge is to, like, get them excited about it, to give them a picture of the problem so they understand why they're doing it, right? A lot of people still think nutrition is something you do if you have concerns about your weight or if you're a fitness person. But to paint this picture of, like, no, if you eat differently, you might not ever have to go to one of these treatment centers again, right? If you eat differently, you might have significant improvements in your mood over the course of the next year, right? You're starting to paint a new picture to people. And a lot of people get excited and then, uh, you know, it, things happen. But like, again, nutrition is so slow that sometimes it happens so slowly, people don't even realize it's happening, right? So they've got to have some reinforcement and positive feedback. If someone's been on a low fiber diet, for a long time, it's tricky to just go on a high fiber diet, right? The body's gonna reject it. They're not fiber friendly. So one of the challenges is to do a gradual and progressive reintroduction, like just like <coughs> add the baby carrot, just one, and then like we'll go to two. You know what I mean? Like just as slow as we might have to go. And But these are things that, uh, that matter uh, for improving gut health. Again, getting fiber from foods whenever possible, fruit or vegetable with every meal or snack. I do think that moving away from refined grains and using more whole grains is a big part of the uh, solution. But like, guess what? Whole grains, you got to cook them. No one's, like, no one's trying to do that, right? Uh, uh, getting people like comfortable in the kitchen is a huge part of the work that I do. If you could give someone a smoothie handout 10 times, you make a smoothie with them once, right? And they're already things are way different. So hands-on nutrition is the future. Talk and, and printouts is, is, is not effective. And the evidence is crystal, crystal clear. Um, so yeah, uh, I do give out recipes, but try to encourage people to uh, get their hands dirty, make mistakes, be willing to like have an awful culinary experience. Have it come out, you know, not that great. And just encourage people. No, so we don't do enough cooking. Uh, we also don't do enough chewing. 
right? Getting people to slow down is also part of the work that I do. Omega-3s, we talked about. Fermented foods also can be helpful. Um, kimchi, sauerkraut, kefir, all things that I do in my practice. I get people to eat uh, on a regular basis, never hungry, never full, not go long periods of time without eating. Something like intermittent fasting or a lot of these thick, trendy things might work great for someone, but they don't necessarily work great for people that have mental health issues because of their neurochemical sensitivity. Does that make sense? So if someone's already got dopamine and serotonin imbalance, doing an extreme diet is contraindicated. So I get people off of extreme things and get them on to a path towards recovery. I wrote a chapter about nutrition for addiction recovery. If anyone's interested in it, you can email me and I'll send it to you. It just came out. It's got the guidelines. It's got much more information if you're into this kind of thing. We talked about artificial sweeteners. I do think they're important because uh, turns out like they reduce bacterial diversity. Artificial sweeteners reduce beneficial microbes, period, right? We've all, like, there's no biochemical free ride, right? Like, oh, you've got this thing. It gets to taste sweet and there's no calories. Like, no, it is causing problems. And I think it'll be much more clear in the next few years. Artificial sweeteners are destroying our gut. Destroying might be a strong word, but I'm going to go ahead and use it, right? Um, strong language. Medications also affect our gut. A lot of medications that people use reduce bacterial diversity. And people gain weight on medications. It's not just because they got hungrier. It's because they, they lost out on beneficial microbes. And so these are things that require some knowledge. You can't always fix them. And like, yeah, a little kimchi is not going to fix it, right? But like doing all of the things all of the time for months and years can make a difference. Um, this is more information about how medications affect it if you're interested. Um, think into the uh, vagus nerve. Think into new ways that we can use nutrition to in improve uh, the epidemics of anxiety and depression. In early recovery, do we, mo do we monitor weight? Or does like talking about weight trigger eating disorders, right? These are the things that I get to think about and talk through with treatment teams, et cetera. Um, with food addiction data, should we reduce people's exposure to highly palatable foods? Or does reducing their exposure make them limited and diety and cause disordered eating? These are all the challenges that I face with people. Um, as someone that works with eating disorders, I know that like the good versus bad foods isn't always helpful, but we can start to think about foods as being either gut harming or gut healing. And that's a different framework that I've been able to use with people, and it certainly resonates, right? So, like, from a calorie standpoint, a Diet Coke might be better than a Coke, but, like, from a gut standpoint, it's less clear. Does that make sense? Uh, intuitive eating is really popular. Um, there's an assumption that we can trust our body wisdom, and I think that if certain things are in place, like your gut's in balance, they're not inflamed, there isn't clear evidence of addiction, they've been trained in mindfulness, we can assume that one is in touch with their intuition around food. However, if someone's gut is completely out of balance, there's high levels of addiction, the hormonal extremes are to the left and to the right, it's, it's almost naive to ask someone to just be intuitive, right? It might be a goal, but it might be 18 months out, right? It's always a good end goal, but there's a lot more going on. So uh, to bring it all home, Calorie is not a calorie. I'm sorry, it's not. You have to stop saying that. We have to consider the biology. There's way more going on than calories. Nutrition is profound information that we send to our brains and our bodies on a daily basis. And it has the potential to change our ecosystem, to change our genetic expression. And it's not just about vitamins, minerals, and macronutrients. Uh, we do need an intervention. Most people know that when they eat better, they feel better but we never knew why, but guess what? We do now. A lot of the foods that are processed, we call them processed foods, they contain additional ingredients that have negative effects on gut bacteria. So when you eat more whole foods, you feel better because your gut is in better balance. Um, and there's probably some other reasons and people that have body image issues might be influenced in different ways. Uh, so my personal food philosophy, is that all foods fit, but not all foods fit for all people. Just because the food industry manufactures it and sells it doesn't mean that we have to include it, right? We can, we can, we can hold the line. 
And that's what I think public health is, uh, you know, needing to consider. It's like, because I've been a dietitian now for six, seven years, and like I've had an impact on a lot of people at the individual level. But like at the population level, like things are getting worse, right? So that's why I'm like, let's start to think about these things at the big picture level. We collected some data at treatment centers in the uh, Los Angeles area. Out of 128 that met our inclusion criteria, only 39 offered nutrition services. And out of those 39, um, only eight used dietitians. So there's a lot of other professionals doing nutrition services at these places. So uh, there's a need. They're not saying they're all like chasing out to hire. A lot of them would rather not have a dietitian, right? Because it's easier to just do their thing. But with the data that I'm looking to, um, you know, produce, hopefully things will change. Uh, so we need to go upstream. We need to not just think about individuals, but look at the policy. And that's what I'm up to now at UCLA. And we always need to consider the social determinants of health. I, uh, I love this because it paints a picture of what we see on the outside, right? We see problems at the branch and the leaf level, but we need to start thinking about what's going on at the root, right? You've heard the root of the problem, the root cause, the fundamental cause. And part of what I do now is not just look at the roots, but look at the soil, everything that's going on. And so I get people to conceptualize like being lifted up, like cleaning out the soil and having their roots grasp a new soil to change their life from the inside out. And that's part of the message of nutrition and recovery. Interestingly, uh, neuron patterns in the brain look a lot like trees. And um, uh, I get people to start thinking about how are you watering your tree? Like, what are you putting in? And there's some Cherokee wisdom that I love about the two wolves. I don't know if anyone's heard it, right? One is evil, right? Anger, envy, sorrow, greed. And the other is the good, peace, love, hope, serenity. And the little grandson asked his grandfather, well, which wolf wins? And the grandfather said, whichever one you feed, right? But it's also true that we have to think about what we're feeding our gut bacteria, right? Because there's a lot more going on than we've ever imagined. And what we eat has a profound effect on their existence, which in turn affects us in ways that we're not aware of. I've been getting people on board with this, and it's really exciting to be a dietitian at this uh, time where things are starting to change. I always remind people that it's not enough to stare up the steps. We must step up the stairs. So that's going to require a lot of action, being able to carry the message effectively and to, ta to tailor it and target it to our populations accordingly. There's not one message, right? There is not one thing that I could say that's going to be helpful to all people. And um, I would encourage people to, uh, you know, get some additional training in like one-on-one -on -one work with people because um, it's really joy to be able to, like, I have had days where I sit, I've done eight, nine sessions back to back without a break. And I leave the office and I feel energized. I feel like I made a difference. And I know that people appreciate what I've been able to contribute. Food for thought is no substitute for the real thing. And uh, with that, I think we're done. If anyone has questions.